If you would, I want to turn your attention back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. This is where we um, started last week. This is where we're going to be for the next several weeks, considering a portion of the Sermon on the Mount, specifically looking at the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are often misunderstood and potentially misapplied. Um, and so last week we opened up our series talking a little bit about the, the historical background and, and who Matthew was addressing and who he was writing to. And he was writing to the Jews who were primarily looking for the Messiah in an external materialistic sense that would deliver them from um, the Roman Empire that would provide that kind of relief for them. Um, but Matthew presents Jesus Christ in his gospel as the king, and he, he states it from the beginning to the end to prove the point that Jesus is the king and that this king has a kingdom. He refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. And we are citizens, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, we are citizens within that kingdom. If we are unbelievers, as many of us before coming to Christ, we once were, and there may be unbelievers here this morning, we and you were born into the kingdom of darkness that was ruled and is ruled by the devil, the little g God, the devil. But whenever we were saved, we were delivered out of that kingdom and transferred into the kingdom of the Lord. Now, that should have a contrast. We should see the immediate contrast in our mind, right? Kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of God, where God's citizens live and where Christ reigns and rules in the hearts of men and women, right? So immediately there's a contrast. So think of the Beatitudes in light of that. How do and how should the kingdom citizens living for Christ in this kingdom in the earth be living? Now, when you approach this narrative, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you look at passages of Scripture. Is this descriptive or prescriptive? Is Jesus describing something or is he prescribing something? This is one of those passages that he's doing both. <laughs> he's describing what life is like in the kingdom and what it should be while also prescribing how Christians ought to live and how they were meant to live. And so that is a little bit of the background leading into our discussion today. And so Jesus, just like he did last week, with a countercultural truth about being poor in the spirit, how that would have captured the attention of his original audience there, of being spiritually bankrupt, like a spiritual beggar before the Lord, God does the exact same thing in this second beatitude that should capture our attention. And so let's read the beatitudes in their entirety, and then we're going to focus on verse 4 today. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful. For they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Our particular beatitude that we're going to focus on this morning comes out of verse 4 when Jesus says these words. He says, Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Think about that for just a moment. Blessed are those who mourn, or another way you could say it is, happy are those who are sad. Does that make sense? <coughs> to our understanding, initially just at first glance, how can you be both happy and sad at the same time, and how is grieving something to be blessed and to be looked upon with favor as it's a good thing? We have to remember that when we come to these words, when we're reading the Beatitudes, and he says, blessed, blessed is the one who is poor in spirit. He's essentially saying, oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. This is a person who has divine favor. This is a person who has spiritual well-being. Why? Because God favors them. God blesses 
this kind of life. So God blesses mourning. God blesses sadness. Many of us, if we're honest, struggle to understand the Beatitudes as a whole. And if we're honest, we struggle to understand this particular Beatitude here in verse 4. Now, he is saying it's good to mourn, but I believe the reason that we have this struggle and follow me is that we approach God's Word from our modern day context. When we hear the word mourning, immediately in your mind when you read that beatitude, your mind goes to a loss that you've experienced. The grief of losing a loved one, right? The pain and the suffering that you've felt when you've lost something, someone, a relationship, a way of life. We can all relate to that, right? Not that that is unbiblical. Because there is truth that God will comfort those who are in pain and who are suffering. And God will certainly provide strength for those facing struggles and difficult circumstances. Those facts are true. However, that's where we trip up in this beatitude is we take our understanding of what it means to mourn and we put it into the biblical framework there in the Beatitudes. That's not Jesus' original meaning of what it means to mourn. That wasn't the biblical context of the word. When he used the word that he used that we're going to talk about in a little bit, when he used that word, his listeners understood it for how it was meant, and it hit them hard. So while it is true that he does provide strength and comfort, listen... For those heartaches that we face. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He does provide comfort. But there is a bigger picture here that he is talking about to his disciples. And that we would do well to understand in its original context. Because if we remember from last week, whenever Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit... He, that the imagery there was a very strong word that reminded us of a New Testament beggar. So the one who is poor in spirit is the one who is spiritually bankrupt, who is uh, spiritually impoverished. So it wasn't the natural understanding of the word poor. Jesus wasn't saying that you're blessed whenever you don't have the financial resources. He's saying you are blessed and you're, you're going to receive blessing from God when you empty your life of yourself. You will be blessed. Apply that same spiritual element and principle to this beatitude. Blessed are those who spiritually mourn, for they will be comforted. These beatitudes are not natural tendencies. Everyone, every person in here, believer and unbeliever, experiences mourning, don't they? Experiences natural mourning, natural pain, suffering. So it can't mean a spiritual sense here. So Jesus is not talking about something that everyone can experience in a natural sense. It's that supernatural spiritual element that we're going to discuss today. And so to understand this, I'm going to ask three questions today. We're going to answer them. What does it mean to mourn? Why is it important to mourn? And then lastly, it will lead into us asking ourselves this question... Does my life reflect this type of mourning that Jesus is referring to? And so the title of the message this morning is Good Morning. And there is such a thing as good morning. And I see some of you laughing. Yes, that was intentional. Good morning. And so let's ask ourselves the first question. What does it mean to mourn? Jesus uses the strongest word to describe mourning. And how it's translated in the Greek, it's the strongest form of the word mourning. And it does carry this. Listen, the word that's used here for mourning is used for mourning for the dead, passionate lament for one who was loved. If you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's the word that is used of Jacob's grief when he believed that Joseph was dead. It's defined as the kind of grief, here it is, the kind of grief that takes hold of a person. The kind of grief that takes hold of a person and produces something. This kind of grief takes you. It, 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 it takes a hold of you 
and it causes unrestrained tears as one who is lamenting and mourning and weeping and grieving over the loss of a loved one. In the spiritual sense, one who mourns is one who is like the one mourning the dead, tearful, wailing, crying, weeping. It is a grief that just comes from within and it produces something. Does that make sense? And it's a strong word. It can't be a natural grief or mourning because we're talking about spiritual truths in a spiritual kingdom by a king and its citizens. Paul helps us understand. So I want to turn your attention to 2 Corinthians. Um, you can turn there. You don't have to turn there. But I will read from 2 Corinthians chapter 7 in just a moment, verses 8 through 10. What Paul says in this passage in 2 Corinthians is going to provide us with insight on what it means to mourn biblically. And it will help us to form a definition of what it means to mourn. In the biblical context, what mourning often referred to, and don't miss this, they understood it to mean, and it referred to a person who is grieving over their own personal sin. One who not only grieves over their own personal sin, but the corporate sin in the body of Christ, the sin within a nation, a community. Mourning in the biblical framework and context was understood in that way. Paul's words here helps us to understand it. Beginning in verse 8 of chapter 7, Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth and he says, For even if I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. His letter that he wrote grieved them. They, they were grieved and felt sorrow because his letter called out the sin within the church and their lives. And if I regretted it since I saw that letter grieved you, yet only for a little while, I now rejoice, not because you were grieved. He's not having joy because they were sorrowful. He says, but because your sorrow, your grief, led to repentance, Paul says. For you were grieved as God willed, so that you didn't experience any loss from us. Verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death, Paul says. Paul is saying this grief and this sorrow is tied to the will of God and not to the consequences of the world. Christians mourn differently than unbelievers. Christians' mourning is temporal. Unbelievers' mourning is a foretaste of an eternal mourning that's going to be experienced unless they turn to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, when the Bible talks about repentance, what is it that people repent from? Sin. You're not going to find anywhere in the Bible that says to repent from something other than sin in the Bible. So when Paul says this is a grief, a sorrow that leads to repentance, this is a grief and a mourning and a weeping that leads the child of God to repent from the sin in their life. That is what mourning is. We see it through other portions of Scripture, and I could give you many, but I don't think you want to be here until 1 or 2 in the afternoon. I will tell you, though, what Joel says. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Brother Paul's class has been studying Joel. Maybe you've already covered this passage. It says, Even now this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. Joel says, turn to the Lord, weep, which is an outward manifestation of mourning. Weep, mourn to the point that you turn back to God. And when you turn back to God, He is compassionate. He is full of mercy. He will forgive you if you but weep and mourn over your sin. He was talking to the nation of Israel. Weep and mourn for the sin, for the rejection, for turning away from me. Come back to me. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 is essentially saying, blessed are those who are sorrowful, 
to a point that it leads them to turn to God in repentance. Blessed is that person. Blessed and happy is he. Joyful is he. Is the one who sees their sin and mourns it. Grieves over it. Doesn't entertain it. Doesn't hide it. Doesn't conceal it. Doesn't pretend that it's okay. But the one who mourns. Now, there is a connection to the Beatitudes. Our Sunday school class talked about it this morning. To be poor in spirit is where it all starts. There is a, no accident why Jesus gave the sermon in the order that he did. To be poor in spirit is to empty yourself. Those who are poor in spirit, because they're the ones that acknowledge that they need God, that they can do nothing apart from Christ, there's no good in them, they're not prideful, the one who is poor in spirit will mourn for sin. Why? Because they're poor in spirit. They see themselves for who they are apart from Christ. Okay? One, people will turn to the parable of the prodigal son, which is a great parable, by the way, about the forgiveness and mercy and grace of the father and how the son repents from his situation, how he changes his mind and changes direction, which is a beautiful illustration of repentance. But to capture this beatitude in light of last week's lesson on poor in spirit and this one, to me, what stuck out in my study was Luke chapter 18. I want to read these verses to you. Luke chapter 18, when Jesus gives the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I want you to hear these words that Jesus says, and he tells why he's giving it. I love it. I love it completely because the Lord and John in his writing, or Luke, sorry, in his writing, we've been studying John, that's why I said John, I think. Luke in his study, in his words, his writing, tells us plain as day why Jesus has given this parable. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, he says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. There's your person who's full of themselves. Now listen. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Wow, really? God, I thank you that I am not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. There is your example of a person who is so prideful and full of themselves. Verse 13, but the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus closes the parable by saying, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That is, to me, a beautiful picture of how the beatitude of being poor in the spirit and how mourning over sin work together. To the parable in here, the Pharisee could not repent of his sin because he didn't see it. He was so blinded by how good he was and how righteous he was and how beautiful the outside of his cup looked but didn't even realize the filth on the inside of the cup. God could not and cannot fill that kind of person. Because that kind of person is full of themselves. There's no room for God. But this tax collector in this parable couldn't even raise his eyes to look into heaven because he didn't even feel worthy. And he calls out to God and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. This tax collector saw himself appropriately in light of God's holiness and who God is. That he was a poor, wretched sinner in light of God, and he is crying out to God, have mercy on me. And God certainly exalts that kind of person, the one who is poor in spirit, the one who mourns. And so let's define what it means to mourn biblically. I'm going to put it on the screen here. This is what it means to mourn biblically. To mourn is to be so heartbroken over sin that it affects your mind, 
your heart and your will. It's to be so heartbroken over sin that it affects not only what you think, but what you feel, but what you do. Okay? Dr. Warren Wiersbe, where I got inspiration from this definition, it wasn't his definition, but I can't claim it as 100% my own. In his writing, I want to share one of his quotes to you that just, it really helped frame this definition of what it means to mourn in light of God's Word. Dr. Warren Wiersbe says this, When my consciousness of sin rests only in my mind, then it is regret. When it affects my mind and my heart, it is remorse. But when my concern over my sin brings me to the place where I am willing to turn from it and obey God, when my concern affects my will as well as my mind and my heart, then I have experienced true repentance. I agree 100% with what he said. Dr. Wiersbe goes on to say that remorse and regret are dangerous in the life of a believer that it has to be backed up by what true repentance is. It has, if it does not impact your actions, it's useless. There's a story of, a, of two kids in a Sunday school class, and the teacher asked a question to their Sunday school class, and maybe you've heard the story. She asked the class, what is repentance? And a little boy spoke up and said, well, repentance is feeling sorry and having sorrow over your sin. And the teacher said, absolutely, that's, that's a great answer, Johnny. That's a great answer. That is what repentance means. But a little girl spoke up and she said, but wait a minute. She said, no, repentance is being sorry enough to quit. Okay? Makes sense, right? right. Out of the mouths of babes. Being sorry enough to quit. Yeah. Now, can't be just selfish. So first, that mourning starts internally with your sin, my sin, yeah. mourning over it. Just think about this with me, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's okay. When was the last time that you and, and myself have actually grieved over our sin? Biblically speaking. Have you cried over your sin? Has it brought you pain and anguish? Or have you become numb and apathetic towards it? Only God can help you answer that question as I've had to deal with this week. So not only does it impact and being sorrowful over our own sin, but also sorrow because of the world's rejection of Jesus. Feeling sorrow over the direction the world is going. Feeling sorrow over the one who doesn't know Christ and the doom that awaits them. Feeling sorrow over a church that may be divided. That kind of sorrow. The kind of sorrow that Jesus even expressed in the morning that Jesus referred to when Jesus wept. The, 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 the destruction that sin causes. And by the way, another sidebar note, if you want to make note of this, feeling sorry about your sin isn't having sorrow over the consequences of your sin. It's the cause of it. Okay? If you just feel sorry for the consequences of your sin, you don't, you're not feeling sorrow over what you should feel sorrow for. Feel sorrow over not just who you are, but what you've done and then what it's caused. Sometimes we feel sorrow over the consequences because we got caught. And we mourn the consequences, but we're not mourning sin. Yeah. If you're paying attention, say amen. amen. Okay, good to know. <laughs> All right, second question. Why is it important to mourn? Now, these sounds like I'm not questioning your intelligence. Wanting to define what mourning is. And then answering this question, why is it important to mourn in the biblical sense? Why is it important to mourn? And don't miss these. This, this is something that has just hit me all week. Mourning sin in your life or the collective sin at large in a culture or in a church enables you to draw closer to God. Okay? Mourning sin enables you as a Christian to draw closer closer to the Lord Jesus and to God the Father. What does James say? In James chapter 4, he says, Draw near to God and He will what? Draw near to you. Now, we like that verse. We like to pull that verse, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you, but it's qualified by a few things. 
We all have the Holy Spirit if we're Christians. Every one of us have the same Holy Spirit. There's not a version 2.0 out there, Brother Bob. It's the same Holy Spirit, God's presence within us. <laughs> but if we aren't living in accordance to God's will, we're not going to experience His manifest presence in our life. He says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. There was an issue going on. He says, cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Wow. James knows how to get a crowd's attention. Right? But he's proven a point. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. But understand this. You have to cleanse your hands. Sinners, repent. He says, be miserable, mourn, and weep. He's talking about sin. Be miserable, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Wow, that is such a great outlook. But he's saying, don't treat your sin as if you're sitting around a group of people just laughing over a, a foolish lifestyle, over a lifestyle maybe of immorality. Don't be sitting around just laughing. And it seems like any time I go to a, a sporting event or wherever, I always sit behind the drunk. Always. <laughs> or the group of them. And they are so loud, and they just laugh, and they have no care or concern about the people around them. And they're probably going to watch it on Facebook, and I welcome anybody to church. But right across the street from where we live, we have a bunch of college guys that every now and then, they want to go out and just start lifting their car. And I don't know. I can see it on my camera. They're loud, laughing. You know they've been drinking. I mean, they're full of something, and it's not the spirit. And they go out. And I can watch them on the camera. They're all like, go ahead and do it. And they lift this car, and they just drop it. And then they start laughing. Okay? And I know that's a funny story, but we shouldn't treat sin like that. You know? Uh, and again, yes, I, I, it's that lifestyle. I laugh about it, but I'm just like, you know what? Sometimes that may be how I treat sin. I'm just laughing. I'm, I'm amused by it. And our culture is certainly amused by it. So he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning. Don't, don't laugh over the things that breaks God's heart. Yeah. Oh. Right? You see? Don't laugh over that what God grieves over. And if you're watching on Facebook, you are welcome here anytime. <laughs> you can lift our cars if we can't move them out of the parking lot. <laughs> if we have a flat tire, we'll call on them. Okay? All right. And so James is calling people to mourn over their sin. And then David in Psalm 51 says, The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God, David says. God will not despise a heart that is broken over sin. As a matter of fact, what does he say? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Amen? And so not only does it enable us to draw closer to God, God comforts us when we grieve over our sin. He provides comfort. God is the one. David says it beautifully. God restore the joy. God restore the joy of my salvation. Because sin will cause it to leave or be diminished. David isn't just asking for forgiveness from his sin in the Psalms. He's saying, Lord, forgive me. Forgive the guilt of my sin and restore the joy of my salvation. Create in me a clean heart so that I might not sin against you. Right? He's saying... Clean me, Lord. Forgive me. Restore joy so God comforts us. That's the promise in the beatitude. But it's dependent on living a life that is one of poor in spirit and one that is mourning. You don't pick and choose. You have to be poor in spirit to mourn. And he's saying that's a blessed life. That's a life that will find comfort in me. That's a life I will restore. And God strengthens us when we grieve over our sin. Have you felt that? When you honestly turn to Him and you let your walls down and you turn to Lord in repentance, 100% of the time I have found strength, not in myself, but in the Lord Jesus. Amen. That He forgives me. That He is compassionate. And it, again, the badness of people does not lead them to repentance, but the goodness of God. In light of God's holiness, God's goodness, God's kindness, God's mercy, for me to sin... For him to empty me, it would be like taking a bucket of, or, or a glass of dirty water, which represents my life and my sin, and God pours it out and pours a nice, clean 
cup of water. That's refreshing. But then for me to go and put poison in it or to go back and put dirt in it, that should impact me. I received this that I didn't deserve. God is so good and gracious. And because of that, when we sin, it should cause us to mourn in light of God's goodness. God comforts us. He comforts us through His Word. The same Word that reveals our sin also provides for us the words of salvation, the words of comfort, of encouragement, right? God comforts us through the Holy Spirit. He's referred to as the Comforter, the Counselor, who will remind us of all the things that God has said, who comes to reside within every believer. God not only comforts us through His Word and His Holy Spirit, but through His people. Have you ever been encouraged by a fellow Christian that God has sent your way to offer you encouragement? I certainly have. You think of how God comforted Paul by sending um, Titus and how Titus comforted Paul by reporting to Paul the problems in the church had been solved because Paul was having sorrow over that, over the sin going on in the church. And so God provided comfort through the form of Titus to bring that report to him, right? And so when he says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted, yes, it's an immediate comfort, that comfort of forgiveness, of strength, of encouragement, but it also points us forward to the blessed day when he comes back, when sin will be no more, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, and he will wipe away every tear. Now listen, we read that at funerals, don't we? And certainly we shed tears when we lose loved ones. We certainly do, and it hurts us deeply. But it's a worldly kind of mourning because we've lost something or someone. He's going to wipe away every tear, not just those who are brokenhearted, over loss in a worldly sense. He's going to wipe away the tears of the struggles of the Christian life that you've experienced because of sin. The struggles and the tears that you've shed over the state of the world, the community, the church, ministry. He's going to eradicate sin. There will be no more pain, suffering, and He will wipe away every tear. And then lastly... We become more like Christ when we mourn sin. We sang the song, and I'm glad that they chose that particular song this Sunday, Man of Sorrows. The Bible refers to Jesus as the man of sorrows in Isaiah. Because Jesus knew what it was to mourn, did he not? He, he wept over Jerusalem. He mourned over Jerusalem. He wept at Lazarus' graves, Lazarus grave, which is also misunderstood. He wasn't sad because Lazarus was dead. He was sad because people were wailing and crying so loud in a, in a worldly sense over, over this death. That's why Jesus was weeping, and he was weeping because of that sin-caused grief and response. That's why Jesus wept. Jesus wept in the garden right before his crucifixion, didn't he? The Bible says that he wept he, with loud cries and tears as he faced the cross. And what's also interesting is in Hebrews it says, the joy that was set before him. Wow. Just see, it doesn't make sense in our mind. There was joy in his weeping. Well, why was he facing joy in a moment of heartache over the fact that he was going to become sin on our behalf? It was because the joy was that it was going to provide salvation, a way of escape, of deliverance. That's what brought joy. But we become more like Jesus when we mourn over sin. Yes, sir. Lastly, to close our time today, and hopefully this has been impactful and I trust the Spirit of the Lord has spoken to you today and to me. We have to answer this question. So what does it mean to mourn in the biblical sense and understanding what Jesus is saying? Why is it important for me to mourn? And then third, we can't escape this. None of us in here can escape it. Does my life reflect this type of mourning? I can't answer that for you. I can only answer it for me. Does my life reflect this type of mourning? Sadly, in our day, more and more people are mourning less and less, if at all, about sin. 
They are excusing sin in our culture. It's excused. There's a procrastination about dealing with sin. They're calling sinful thoughts and behaviors anything but sin. Churches have seemed to leave that out of their vocabulary and from the pulpit. That is a word that is no longer used as it should be. It is instead used as mistake or failure, but it's sin. And what's worse is that people are applauding those who are in sin and applauding those who support ideologies and values that are sinful. It's applauded. And if you're not applauding, then you're seen as the problem. Behavior that shouldn't be funny is laughed at now and behavior that would quite honestly make God blush and make any one of us blush. It's laughed at now. Hopefully, when we look at our life, that's not the way that we're handling it. Hopefully, we're not sweeping it under the rug. So even though, even though the culture has changed drastically, even though that some of God's people have changed their view of sin and their response to it, we have to remember that God has not changed. Sin still offends God. Sin still saddens God. Period. Across the board. God has never changed His mind on that. He is light and in Him is no darkness at all, John says in, the God, in his epistle, doesn't he? He is light. There is no darkness. He is holy. That is the chief characteristic of the Lord. He is holy. And there's no unholiness in Him. Now, think of it in these terms. So God is holy and Him is no darkness at all. So sin is like this stench. Sin is something filthy to God. Let me ask you this question. Do you like the smell of garbage? <laughs> Who in here likes to, to walk into a home or walk by a dumpster of rotten garbage? If you like the smell of garbage, there's something wrong with you. We need to have prayer over you after the service. Nobody does. Neither does God. Sin is like rotten garbage to Him. He doesn't like the smell of it. And so, in our home, and we're at the house, and the trash piles up, what do we do? What should we do? <laughs> Man, that's a better question. I would say the majority of us, it gets to a point, it gets full, we take the trash out, don't we? We, we take it outside, and then hopefully... When we put it in the big trash can outside, hopefully it finds its way down to the road for it to be collected and taken to a landfill. And have you ever driven by a landfill? In Kentucky, there was this landfill where we lived close. Every time you went to work, it was like the most miserable part of the drive. And depending on how hot it was, or I guess whose trash they brought there that day, it was awful. But then sometimes it got to a point you drove by, and well, it's not that bad. But it was so nasty. And sin is like garbage to the Lord. We would take our trash out. But you know what happens sometimes? What we do, we take about, think of the trash, think of a trash can as our life. We tend to pile our trash in there. Right. And in a normal way, we would take it out. But in a spiritual sense, what we do is we let it keep piling up. Right. We tie the bag, we put it to the side. We start filling it up with more garbage. Mm. And then we wonder why the house stinks. Right? So what do we do? Okay, I know the trash is full. I know it needs to be taken out. Let me grab Febreze. <laughs> because I become nose blind. You heard that? I become nose blind to this garbage, but I become nose blind to the scent in my life. So I'm just going to spray some Febreze to mask the scent and be like, yeah, that's good enough. I'll take out one bag, but I'm going to leave this bag over here. Friends, don't treat your sin like, like that. Don't try to spray for breeze and become nose blind to the sin and the stench that it creates in your life. And you know what happens, though? Say we hold on to it and we don't turn it over to God. You know what that essentially communicates to God? Deal with it. We're telling a holy God that 
to deal with the stench in our life. There's no other way to say it. We're telling him to get used to it. That's what it communicates. Stench still offends him, it saddens him, and it carries a stench. And so, if we refuse to mourn over sin, we are choosing to forfeit the spiritual blessings that God has for us. Don't miss that. We're forfeiting them. Now, Jesus has challenged us in this beatitude, right? For us to reflect and to say, wow, does my life reflect this? Do I deal with my sin? Do I mourn over it? Do I, or do I dismiss it? You know, those are questions. Do I dismiss it? Do I hide it? Do I continue in it? Another question. Or do I recognize the damage it creates and acknowledge it so that I will turn from it? How do you handle and how does your life reflect mourning over sin? Which of those would describe it today? And it's okay to be honest. There's no shame in admitting that. Because there is grace and there is forgiveness. And there is restoration of fellowship in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. King David wrote about sin's lasting impact. He says in Psalm 32, listen to his words, When I kept silent, in other words, when I concealed my sin, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Then I acknowledged my sin. I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I want you to read this with me, starting at, then I acknowledge. Can we read that together this morning? Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Do you believe that? You can turn to him and he will forgive you. Bottom line, and we are going home. Okay? Hey now, you watch it. Just kidding. Bottom line is this, right there. Sorrow over sin prompts repentance. It brings joy and a deeper connection or a deeper intimacy with God the Father. That's what sorrow over sin does. That's what it will lead to. That's what's available right now. It is available right now. If, if as we have gone through this, if the Lord has spoke to you and has revealed to you, and in many cases He has in a room with this many people, I am certain that God has revealed some type of sin in somebody's life in this room because if he hasn't, then I'm the only one. Okay? God, I trust he's done that. But know that if you take that trash to him, he is going to get rid of it. Bring the trash to the Lord. Confess it. Have sorrow over it. And then stand restored in our relationship with the Lord. And we sometimes wonder why. why. Why am I experiencing some things in my life? You know, you can be experiencing difficulties because you're being faithful to the Lord, but you may be experiencing difficulties because you're being unfaithful to God and you're hiding your sin and you're concealing it. God blesses the one who mourns over sin and He comforts them. God blesses that person, that life. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted.